Here, we're going to look at the multi-attribute model of attitude. It's going to enable us to better conceptualize and measure attitudes so we can use them more effectively in marketing. The multi-attribute model of attitudes, also known as the ATO model, or the attitude toward the object model. Now, essentially, attitudes represent the summary or the compilation, the sum of all our salient beliefs about the attitude object. So how I feel about Verizon or Sprint is the summary of all the different beliefs I have. For example, for Verizon, I may believe that they have excellent 4G LTE coverage, but they have an expensive data plan. Sprint, on the other hand, I may believe, has poor 4G LTE, but has a very attractive data plan because it's unlimited. Beliefs that are salient, or salient beliefs, means that those are the beliefs that are activated in our memory and are present in our thinking when we're accessing our attitude. So this means that not all beliefs go into every time we access our attitude. Only the ones that are activated at the time we're making accessing this attitude. Now, sometimes we forget important attributes because we get distracted or so focused on something else. I may be so focused on 4G LTE coverage that I forget about other attributes that might be important, like whether or not there's a contract, how much, um, what the selection is of, of new phones. Sometimes we come across new features or attributes we didn't know about. A salesperson might tell me about a new feature that I didn't know about. Now, the salient beliefs that we have at any one point in time are influenced just like the way selective perception is. We tend to focus on the beliefs that meet our needs. So if my need is price, I'm going to focus on the beliefs about the cost and maybe not so much on the quality. The more important the beliefs are, the higher the level of involvement, the more beliefs I'm probably going to be able to have salient at one time. And the more the beliefs are consistent with what I already know and, and other related attitudes or concepts, the more likely I'm, they're going to be salient. Beliefs that are contrary to what I already believe, I'm more likely to not include those. They're less likely to be salient. Now, so the overall idea is that these salient beliefs, the ones that are operating at that point in time we access our our attitude are combined, manipulated some way in our brain, all right, to form this kind of evaluative judgment or learned tendency to evaluate something in a certain manner. Beliefs have two components that we need to consider for this model. The first one is the idea that any feature or attribute of the attitude object can be looked at as being good or bad. It could look, be looked at as being favorable or unfavorable. For example, 4G LTE coverage is a favorable attribute for any sales service provider. Low prices is another good attribute for any cell phone service provider. The term we're going to use in the model to represent this is E, because it stands for the evaluation, good or bad, of the attractiveness or goodness of an attribute held by the attitude object. The other component is the degree to which a specific attitude object has that attribute or property, right? In other words, this is our belief, right, that Verizon has or does not have 4G LTE coverage. In this case, we would have a positive belief, a strong belief, that Verizon has very good 4G LTE service. For Sprint, our belief would be it does not have much 4G LTE service, and therefore it possesses very little of good 4G LTE coverage. 
It does, however, possess low prices, which is a good attribute, whereas Verizon does not possess good prices, and that so they do poorly on that attribute. So to kind of put it together, and it'll make more sense in a minute when we look at the model. Okay, I promise. But hey, a person's belief kind of has two parts. First of all, it is how important is that attribute in general? Is how important is price? How important is 4G LTE coverage? How important is the data plan? How important is it um, the phones that are available for the cell phone provider? The second part, so the second part is on a particular or with a particular object, in this case, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, etc. To what degree do they have, do we believe they have good service, low prices, a good selection of phones, uh, attractive data plans, etc. So there's two parts to a belief in general. Again, how important that attribute or feature is to us and then to what degree a particular object has it whether they do have it or don't have it and the reason these two are important is that two people may have the same overall attitude we both might like Verizon a lot but the reason might be that for me I really like it because it has the best 4G LTE coverage and that's really important to me Another person might like it, be, not because of the 4G LTE coverage, which is good, but not very important to them. But they may like it because it has the best selection of phones, which might be very important to them. So you can't just measure people's attitudes overall and expect that they feel the same way about the object or the brand. Because there's a difference in what is important to people. And how they perceive it. Now we're going to look at the model but before we do let's just remember that it's a mathematical model and all we're trying to do is capture predict people's attitude towards some object. It doesn't mean that we do these mental calculations in our head or we think like that. It's only a way to try to approximate it okay and what we're trying to do is capture people's beliefs and attitudes with numbers so that we can compare them. So we can compare the attitudes uh, one uh, people may have towards one brand to another. Now, the model looks like this. It's really kind of simple. The attitude towards any object, that's a capital A there, is equal to the sum of, and that happens to be the sigma sign, which looks like a kind of a capital M standing on its side, the sum of how important an attribute is to that person. For example, how important is 4G LTE coverage to you, or to me? And our belief as to how well the brand performs on that attribute. In other words, do they have good 4G LTE coverage? So we multiply those two numbers together, right? And we do that for each important attribute. And then once we have all those sums, we just... From the multiplication we just add them up and that will give us a score and usually the higher the score the more positive the attitude so it's pretty simple the reason we have again separate an e and a b is that not all attributes are equally important to everybody and not all people rate the attitude object verizon's 4g lte coverage or sprints it or Sprint's 4G LTE coverage are the same. So this way we can cover all the main things that... Now we're going to look at an actual example to help make things a little clearer. Let's assume that we conducted a survey of people who like to eat out. And we asked them about three different restaurants. And up at the top, in the top row to the right, you can see we asked about Olive Garden, Chili's, and TGIF. And in the survey, in general, we asked people what were the most important attributes. And in general, they said quality of food, the service, 
the, the menu value, meaning the pricing and what you get, and then the bar. So those are the features or attributes that most people find important. So now you'll notice that the, in the top row, we have those attributes, we have the EI, okay, which are the evaluation of how important quality of food is, service, menu value, and the bar. And we certainly would, wouldn't expect everyone to feel they're all the same. So let's look at the values that we actually got. So we see here that the average value for quality of food was a 9 on a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 being very, very important. So we see that quality of food is very important to people. Service is somewhat important on a scale from 1 to 10. It was rated as a 7 in importance. The value of the menu, meaning relatively the pricing and what you get, was also very important at an 8. And to most bar, I mean to most diners, going to the bar wasn't that important. It was only rated a 4. Now, the attitude score right here in the lower left hand corner represents the total score that Olive Garden and Chili's and TGIF will get on this. But we can also calculate a perfect score, meaning that given that the quality of food is rated in importance of nine, right? What if somebody felt that it was the very best? That would be a 10, the highest score. So we could say, hey, nine times 10, we're taking the EI and multiplying it by the BI, that would be a 90 in that box. And for service, if a, if a restaurant had perfect service, that service was rated a seven in importance, but you did it perfectly, it would be worth 70 points, could be seven times 10. And you can look at the menu value, which was the second most important thing at eight. If a company had the best possible menu value, they could get 80 points here. And then for the bar, it's only worth four points out of 10. But if you did it perfectly, had the best bar, you could get 40 points. If you added those all up, if a bar had a restaurant had perfect quality of food, perfect service, menu value, and bar, the total of those would be 280 points. 90 plus 70 plus 80 plus 40. So that's the best score any of the three restaurants could get. You can't get higher than that. That would mean that you scored the very best in terms of what people believe you have on what's important to them. Now, let's look at Olive Garden. So Olive Garden, all right, for the quality of food was rated as six. So if we multiply, apply nine times six, they got 54 points out of a possible 90. On service, they did pretty well. Service was somewhat important with a seven. They got rated an eight out of 10. So they got 56 points altogether. For menu value, they didn't do so well. They got a six out of 10. Menu value happened to be pretty important, so they managed 48 points. And then for the bar, which wasn't that important, they only received five points. Out of, so they were rated a five out of a 10, not particularly good. So they only got 20 points. So if we add up all those points, a 54, a 56, a 48, and a 20, they received 178 points. Now, that 178 points by itself doesn't mean anything. It just kind of represents how people feel about Olive Garden. We know that if Olive Garden was perfect, their score would have been 280. That would be a, you know, people have just a fantastic attitude towards Olive Garden. But they don't. So they have somewhere in 178. Where it starts to make sense is when we look at the other ones. So let's look at Chili's. And let's look at TGIF. So we'll do Chili's first. And that's this column right here. So you can see that they scored a 7 on quality of food. So 9 times 7 is 63. So they did better than um, Olive Garden. And they only did a 5 on service. So Olive Garden did much better. Um, so Chili's gets 7 times 5. They get 35 points. Menu value. 
chilies did better. They got an 8 out of 10, and menu value is important, so 8 times 8 is 64. And then on the bar, chilies has a pretty decent bar, so even though it was only worth a 4, it wasn't that important to most diners, they still scored 28 points. So if you add up all of Chili's scores, right, they got 190. So this says that people prefer Chili's to Olive Garden. That they have a more favorable attitude towards Chili's than Olive Garden. And we can see, hey, Chili's does better in the quality of food. They have more points. They don't do as well in service, but they do better in menu value, and they do better in the bar. Now we look at TGIF, right? If we look at the quality of food for them, they only got five points. So five times nine is 45. And they did the poorest, and you can see they received the fewest points, 45 versus 54 over here for Olive Garden and 63 over for Chili's. They did okay on service. They got a six. So they did better than Chili's, but not as well as Olive Garden. So they got six points times seven, because that's how much it was, how important it was to people. They got 42 points. They did pretty well in menu value. They did better than Olive Garden, but not better than Chili's. They got a seven. So they end up with 56 points. And then for the bar, they got 90 points. I'm sorry, they got a nine, which represents the highest score there. And it's not worth a lot. It's only, it's not that important to people. But still, I netted them 36 points. So when you look at their score, you add up 45, 42, 56, 36. They got 179 points. So they're a little bit better than Olive Garden, but pretty much the same. We pretty would feel pretty safe saying that Chili's is, most people have a more favorable attitude towards Chili's. Now, if we look at Olive Garden and TJF, almost identical scores, you can see that, hey, the quality of food, People like Olive Garden better, 54 points versus 45. But the service, okay, they also liked it at Olive Garden. They got 56 points versus 42 at TJF. So, but for the value menu, people really like TJF's a lot better. They got 56 points versus 48. And the bar, which wasn't that important, they still received a significant amount of points, 36 versus 20. So you can see that. People's attitudes toward Olive Garden, TJF, can kind of be summarized up by saying that, hey, people go to Olive Garden, like the quality of food and service more. That's more important to them, and Olive Garden does better than that. The people who go to Chili's or have a slightly more favorable attitude towards Chili's, they seem to care more about the menu value and the bar, and those points are enough to make up for the fact that the food may not be as quite as good as Olive Garden's and the service isn't as good either. So there we have three different scores for these three different restaurants. So just to summarize, we see that quality of food is the most important thing to people. Menu value is second, then service, and then the bar. So that's represented by the column there with the EI. That's how favorable those attributes are. And then we can see the individual ratings for each company. Those are the beliefs that Olive Garden has good food, the quality of the food. It's not a very strongly held belief because they only got a 6 out of 10. It's higher for Chili's. The service, the belief for service for Olive Garden was an 8. 5 for Chili's, 6 for TJF and so forth. And at the bottom, you can see their total score, which is made up of those different parts. So given their strengths and weaknesses in quality of food, service, menu, value, and bar, they scored a certain amount. We can probably safely say that Chili's is preferred somewhat to Olive Garden and TGIF. We could probably say that Olive Garden and TGIF, people have about the same attitude, but not for the same reasons. People feel that Olive Garden how Olive Garden has better food and service, where people who will look at TGIF feel that they have uh, more value um, for your dollar, and that people they have a people like the bar there. Both of them have significant room for improvement because we can see that a perfect score, somebody a uh, restaurant that would was rated tens in all categories and all attributes would have scored a 280. So, 
the idea here is knowing this, we would be able to predict that more, more people, when given a choice, would prefer to go to Chili's than to Olive Garden or TGIF because people have, in general, a somewhat more favorable attitude toward Chili's. The whole point of measuring attitudes is to be able to predict behavior. That's what the theory says. We think, we feel, then we do. Now, the question is, is that true? Is that supported by the research? And, especially in the past, the research has not always supported attitude theory. That attitudes often will be, will vary from predicted behavior. That people may predict uh, they'll go to Chili's, but they don't. So what we're going to look at is some of the explanations for this. Now, most of the explanations have to do with measurement issues, not with the theory. So it's good to understand what these issues are because you may do your own marketing research or be purchasing marketing research, and you want to make sure that you understand what can go wrong. The first problem is intervening time. It just means that if you measure attitudes today and then measure people's behavior a long time from today in the future, they're probably not going to match up very well because too much stuff happens. That subjects and their feelings and attitudes change. Attitudes aren't fixed or dynamic. As our beliefs and feelings change, so will our attitudes. I'll give you a quick example. Um, if you'd asked me a year and a half ago about how I felt about Volkswagen cars, I would have had a very positive attitude. We owned two Volkswagens that ran really well, and I enjoyed driving the Rabbit, and my wife enjoyed driving her Beetle. Um, and if you looked at my behavior a year and a half later, um, you would have seen that I traded my Volkswagen in and didn't buy a Volkswagen. I bought a Honda. So you'd say, gee, that didn't predict that. Well, of course it didn't, because what happened? In the time between a year and a half ago when I traded in my car, I had all sorts of problems with the, my Volkswagen. So I wasn't going to keep dumping money into that car. So stuff happens. So you can't have a big window of time between when you measure an attitude and then you expect it to be able to predict behavior. The next issue is specific, specificity. That's a tough word to pronounce. And anyway, the idea is that oftentimes attitude and behavior aren't measured at the same level. And here, it's best through a concrete example that's, that's written here. Um, many times we might ask people, hey, how important is going to class? What's your attitude going to class? And what are most students going to say? Most students are going to say, well, it's really important. And they're going to have a very positive attitude towards attending class. Now, if you pick out any particular day, you know, um, during a semester, um, and you see whether or not students have attended, you might find that a fair amount of students who said that attending class was important to them aren't attending. Well, how come? If you had measured their attitude at the beginning of the semester, not enough stuff had changed, so it's not intervening time. The answer is that a general attitude towards how important is going to class, how important is going to church, doing well at your job, all that kind of stuff. That's general. It doesn't predict on any particular day. On any particular day, a student might have a game, might feel sick, might have other issues they need to attend to, might not feel like going to class. So it's not a good predictor when you go from general to specific. If you want to know whether somebody's going to go to class on, you know, November 15th, then you need to ask them what's their attitude towards going to class on November 15th. Be specific, and then you can look, use a specific measure. If you want, are willing to use a general measure, then sure. You could look at somebody's attendance over the course of the semester to see whether or not attitude predicted. So they're at the same level. General attitude towards attending class, general behavior of going to class measured by their attendance over a semester. Unforeseen environmental or situational events will often break the link between attitude and behavior. This is because these 
environmental or situational events aren't present when the attitude is measured, but are present when the behavior is measured. So an example might be that you might normally go to Chili's, but if you're inviting a significant other, a friend, a coworker, uh, your supervisor, that may change which restaurant that you go to. Similarly, you might like to go to Chili's and that had the highest attitude score, but you're in a rush or you have a really large party and they don't have, really do a good job sitting 10 or 12 or 15 people in an area. So you choose to go to somewhere else. So things crop up in the behavior that aren't accounted for in your questions when you measure people's attitude. And finally, is the idea of degree of voluntary control. That is, there are things that we'd like to be able to do, but we can't or don't think we can actually perform the behavior. For example, we would all like to own a luxury car, so we might have really high attitude scores towards, for me, Porsche. I'd love to own a Porsche, but I'm not gonna go run out and do so. My next car is probably gonna be a Honda or a Toyota. Because I, at this point, I don't feel it makes financial sense for me to own a Porsche. So even though I have a favorable attitude, I don't have the ability, the control, to get what I want, to perform the behavior. So these are the four main factors that often lead to a, a break in the link between attitude and behavior, whether or not we have unforeseen environmental or situational context, the degree of voluntary control, whether or not too much time has passed between measuring the attitude and measuring the behavior, and whether or not the attitude and behaviors were measured at the same level. The question of specificity, so that we make sure that attitudes measured on a general level um, should also look at behaviors measured on a general level. When those things are accounted for, there is a strong link between attitudes and behavior, though not a perfect link.